now. <laughs> right, nearly there. Um, ta -da, ta -da. Let me find my group. Okay. So we can have. There we are. Wonderful. We're live. I can see us. How exciting. <laughs> um, I have to switch off the sound there, otherwise. <laughs> That is awesome. So we are on track. Hello, everyone. Um, just give it a couple of seconds, maybe, to see if somebody is joining us on um, live. Um, yeah, um, sometimes it takes yeah, a little bit of your connections. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we do have some friends who have said they will join us uh, because they're really dying to see this interview <laughs> which is so exciting um actually i think i'm going to start now so you know people can catch up as they go along Join in. yeah exactly so here we go hello my name is tilza schaefer i'm the owner of this group uh, tilza's bookstore on facebook uh, for those of you who watch the recording later on youtube um, I'm an author and uh, in my capacity as interviewer, show host, <laughs> a very new role that I'm having. Um, so I've got Kevin Kuhn here with me and he is an award-winning author. He is really prolific and he does a lot of other things. So I'm so excited to have you, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Tirza. Really uh, excited to be on. That's awesome. So I'm going to ask you a few questions because, of course, we're all so excited to have you with us and to actually be able to find out about you more. You know, we don't always have a best-selling, um, award-winning author here with us. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, First of all, we would like to get to know you as a person, of course. So you tell us who is Kevin and what you do outside of writing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, um, I live in uh, Minnesota, USA. Um, I'm uh, married with three kids. Um, Yep, so that, uh, that, that alone keeps me uh, fairly busy. But um, I used to be a technology executive for a large healthcare company. Um, but uh, um, a little bit ago, I, uh, I, re I basically semi-retired. And now I teach technology at uh, University of Minnesota. Um, wow. I teach both undergrad and uh, master degree courses. Um, so it's, uh, it's called the Carlson School of Business. It's the business school at, at U of M. Um, I really enjoy that. It's uh, um, uh, not that it doesn't have its moments, but it's much less stressful than uh, kind of the, the corporate rat, rat race. Um, so I've been doing that now for, I think, four, four, I think this is my fourth year uh, teaching at, uh, at Carlson at the University of Minnesota. Wonderful. Yeah, I enjoyed my time at university a lot as well, because then at school, it's like there's a lot of students who don't really want to be there. But because at, at university, they can choose what they want to study, isn't it? So you've got people there who are actually interested in what you have to say, isn't it? <laughs> so that yeah. was really wonderful to form young people's minds and have a positive influence on, on their life path as well. That is just it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Can imagine half my family is teachers as well. So and, and outside of yeah, ah, I was just gonna say outside of uh, work, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, my wife and I had lots of plans to travel a lot. <laughs> of course, those are all kind of put on hold. Yeah. We did. Uh, we did luckily get in a, a really nice trip to Italy right before um, right before the pandemic hit. So okay, where that, that did was, you go to Italy? Um, um, it was mostly uh, south, uh, you know, Rome and uh, Cicatera and um, 
a lot of the kind of um, cities around there, uh, Venice, uh, not, not, wait, yeah. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. I've, I've been a couple of times there as well, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. fantastic. Very really romantic, much. isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, very, yeah. very. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. So you're planning once all this Corona business is over, are you yeah. going to come again over the big pond? <laughs> We'd like to. I, I, I'd really like to see Ireland. Um, and the the book I'm writing now has a little, uh, well, the, the main character is an Irish immigrant, so maybe I could write it off as a tax deduction. <laughs> oh, that sounds lovely. I've been to Ireland in my childhood uh, on holiday and I absolutely loved it. It's such a beautiful country. So you are going to enjoy that so much, I'm sure. Definitely. Um, so um, about the writing now, how did you get into that in the first place? What inspired you to, to actually start writing something? Uh, because it's, it's very, you know, like writing is very creative, what you're doing like with technology and that. It, it's a very different part of the brain, isn't it? So yeah, um, it is. How, how did you get into that? Well, um, I've, I've always been a reader. I've always loved to read and I, I read quite a bit. Um, uh, so um, I think when I was, well, like when I was in college, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do technology, but I also, on the side, I did take quite a few literature courses just mm -hmm. because it was more of an interest for me. And then I think in my, I'm not sure if it was my late 20s or early 30s, um, I, I tried to write a novel, um, but it, it didn't really go anywhere. You know, I, I, I got, you know, I don't know, a little ways in and then it kind of dried up. So I, I kind of put that off to the side. And then uh, um, fast forward, I hit 50 and uh, kind of had a little bit of a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. <laughs> As you do, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember telling my wife that I either needed to get a mistress in a sports car or to write a novel. <laughs> and she told me, why don't you write a novel? That was a good decision, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you still get your wife now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good man. <laughs> so I, I started writing and, uh, um, you know, kind of picked the different topic and uh, it, it kind of went and it kept going. And I, uh, I didn't really tell anyone about it, but I, I showed my wife after I was about a third done and, and she really liked it and gave me a lot of encouragement. So I just kept going and I, uh, I actually finished the whole thing in about seven months, um, which I was still working at the time as in my technology executive mm -hmm. role. So I was pretty happy with that. Um, and I really had no clue that there was a long road after the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned all of that on the fly. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, but it's been great. I, I really have enjoyed kind of exploring that creative side and uh, it's I've I think it's made me um, much happier. Um, yeah. Kind of, uh, opening yeah, up that side of my mind. To do that, yes. Um, yeah. That is that is wonderful. I love that story that like, you know, have a mistress in the sports car right and <laughs> what a wonderful story. <laughs> really cracks me up here. Um, Totally love that. And um, yeah, it's, it's like when, when you don't have any idea about the publishing industry, you go like, oh, I'm going to write a book now. You write this book, you know, and a lot of people uh, to them happens what happened to you in the first time round when you started. Um, they start something they can't finish it. I think I, I, I've got piles and piles of unfinished stories in, you know, my basement on paper and that, but <laughs> I collected over the years. But uh, I think that's quite typical for, for yeah. you know, writers to, to do that as well, because um, in part you also um, bring your emotions into it, your feelings yeah. and things. So, um, do you did you feel as well that was very cathartic for you to to write that and like have your oh. emotions and your turmoil that like you said you were in a midlife crisis that you kind of overcame yeah. that with the writing so it, it was in, in fact i started just more i was just journaling right um yeah. just trying to get my feelings and thoughts and everything 
out. And that's, that's really what, you know, when I started. And then at some point, I kind of thought, you know, there's kind of something here. Um, so I, you know, that's when I really started to turn it into a, turn it into a novel. And it, it's funny, because I was also really stressed in my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it wasn't until I, you know, I finished the novel and thought about like, you know, what it was really saying and what the theme was um, that I kind of, I, I talked to my wife and I said, you know, I kind of need to, I kind of think I should take my own advice. And <laughs> that's when I decided to kind of leave the, 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 the corporate um, world and, and go to teaching. And uh, it was really a great thing. So it was really the novel that, that kind of, you know, talked me into that that big life change. Wonderful. That, that is, that's a wonderful journey, isn't it, of self-exploration at the same time. So, of course, now I'm dying to know what this book is all about. You know, I mean, okay, I know, but <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> our viewers want to know, they're dying to know what this wonderful book is all about. That kind of gave your life a new, <laughs> new lease. Yeah. Story. yeah. Yeah, so um, I probably shouldn't have taken on the meaning of life in my first book. <laughs> that's that's kind of it's it's about a, a an everyday guy, you know, who's uh, uh, middle aged, you know, in, in a very similar situation that I am, um, not happy with his life, and uh, he meets this kind of mysterious guy on a train, you know, kind of doesn't like him, kind of an annoying guy. Um, but the guy ends up, um, they have some conversations and, uh, the guy ends up giving him a, uh, Apple watch and, uh, he finds out he can travel, um, and visit his past any 10 days in his past. He gets to choose which 10 days he goes back to. So he kind of mm -hmm. wakes up in the past, lives that day. He still knows everything he knows today. And mm -hmm. then when he, when he goes to sleep, he returns to, um, the current day. So it, it both follows his current life as he's kind of, you know, figuring out. And then it also kind of follows back those 10 days that he, that he relives in his life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it, it's, uh, it doesn't change anything he does in that prior, uh, when he relives those days, it doesn't change anything about today because I really wanted to make it more about him being changed, yeah. not necessarily the, the sci-fi trope of you know, the yeah. butterfly effect or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really, what I wanted to explore was how him looking back on his life would, would change him. Um, so that's, that's really, that's what that's, it's about. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um, it reminds me a little bit of Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol, isn't it? That yeah. Really, really yep. go and have a look, isn't it? It's like that. Yeah. Right. And it makes you reflect more on yourself. When yeah, I mean, just just thinking of yeah, just thinking about if you had that opportunity, what ten days would you go back and relive? Just that exercise alone is um, yeah. kind of you know worth the price of admission, I, I guess I would say. Oh yeah, definitely. That that's not an easy choice. I, I wouldn't want to have to choose that yeah. one. <laughs> Take me a long time to decide on that. Um, you're absolutely wonderful. But how did you come up with this idea? I mean, that is something that that's not like the usual kind of book that somebody writes, isn't it? Like people write self-help books or they write novels, like, you know, I don't know, wrong yeah. or whatever, but uh, like a kind of a story and, and you come up with something like that. It's just amazing. So um, how did you get that idea? Yeah. So when I was in that midlife crisis and I was kind of journaling that's one of the things I did was what's my life been about like what's what have I done what's been important to me and it was literally one of the things I journaled about was what if I if I could relive any 10 days you know what are the 10 most important days in my past and uh, that's kind of got what got me thinking about um, thinking about that uh, as a novel um, that what if what if you got the chance to go back and uh, um, relive those days, yeah. you know what what would that mean to you? Um, just quickly, want to say hi, Gina. She just joined us, and she said she's so intrigued. She wants to check that out as well. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
That is so amazing. It really is. And um, I would also like to know, you, you've kind of gone a little bit into the to the main character of the book, uh, do you realize? Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, who's playing in it, who's kind of featuring yeah. there in that? So um, George is the main character. And I, I actually picked that name because um, it's also a little bit of a retelling of It's a Wonderful Life for people who've seen that that movie. Um, it's kind of a US uh, classic, uh, I think like 30s, 1930s. Yeah, um, James Stewart, right? I used to yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so George is kind of the everyday man, the, you know, again, it was very close to me, you know, in my place uh, where I was, um, you know, just kind of, you kind of question your life uh, at some point, you know, when, when you kind of go through that. Um, and he was doing the same. Um, it, it, it spends quite a bit of time with his wife, Elena. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, she's a pretty big character in the book. Um, and there's a lot of focus on their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I've even told people tell me that it's a bit of a romance, which I certainly I don't really read romance, and I I not I, I maybe I should, <laughs> um, but uh, it certainly wasn't what I intended to, to write. Um, and then uh, and then there's um, this character Shiloh, who is the uh, mysterious character that he meets on the train, and uh, um, a lot of people end up liking him the best. Um, he's very quirky. He's very um, uh, he's he's super high energy and he's always he loves to talk and he loves to explain things and he's he's kind of um, always giving George you know like way more advice than he wants um, and and uh, you know George at first kind of writes him off as just this annoying you know um, this annoying man that he meets on the train that he's kind of trapped with in the same seat and they end up sitting together on his commute to work every day. Um, but over time, it, you know, their relationship changes. And obviously, it, once he realizes that he's, he's got this ability to, to, to grant him the power to visit his past, it all becomes, you know, much more intriguing. Yeah. Um, and then the third, the last character I would just talk about is uh, George's best friend, who's named Cade, who's a really kind of gregarious, um, kind of comic relief, um, you know, uh, uh, um, that uh, also um, really um, is another outlet of George to kind of talk to and try to explore, you know, what he's go what's going on and everything. And it's interesting, I had a reader send me an email that said, uh, they didn't know me, but they, they really felt like the um, George, Shiloh, and Cade were all me. And that they were really, um, you know, kind of forty in the, the id, the ego, and the super ego, which I, I just kind of thought was fascinating. And I kind of sat down and thought of it, and I'm like, you know, that's probably not too far off. Uh, but it's kind of a cool way to, to kind of think of, you know, go back and look at the characters and think about them. Yeah, it's it's wonderful when readers actually are so uh, involved in your story that they see things they even miss yourself, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> While you're right. Yeah. So um, did you plan everything out ahead or did, did you kind of um, like let yourself get surprised where the story was taking you along the way as well? How did that happen the whole time? I'm, I'm a little of both. Mm -hmm. When I started uh, writing the story, um, I probably knew about 50% and I, I did do a rough outline. Um, and then as I went, I continued to outline more, um, but I would never, had a problem with changing from the outline. So if yeah. if, if uh, a character, um, you know, if I really felt their, uh, you know, if I was being honest about like how what their reaction or what they would do, um, you know, I would go with that rather than what was in the what was in the outline. Or if I had a good idea, you know, I, I'm not I'm not wed to my outlines. They're just uh, mm. a way for me to kind of get down on paper, you know, what's in my head, I guess. Yeah. But uh, I, I like to have an outline so I know a little bit about where I'm headed, but I, I, uh, I'm not connected to it enough that I wouldn't, you know, that I'm not willing to change while I'm mm -hmm. 
Uh, what I personally like to know, because that, that's that is a bit similar to how I work as well, because I found when I just kind of start writing, I suddenly don't know how to end the story anymore. Did you have that kind of feeling as well when you just start and you don't know where that's going and I, run out of steam kind of thing? On that book, I did not know how it was going to end. Um, I actually thought of um, three or four different endings. Mm -hmm. And I kind of really um, agonized over how I wanted it to end. Um, but, um, you know, once I got to about 70% complete, it just kind of, I just, one of the endings I felt like was the right one. Mm -hmm. And then I never really looked back. It, it kind of um, felt right. Yeah, some, sometimes things just fall into place, isn't it? So uh, let me ask you, which which are you? Do you are you more of an outliner? Are you more of a on the fly or a little of both? Um, I've been completely on the fly because I've been uh, writing for like ages, for like decades, just for myself. So okay, you know, which is why I also you know got lots of papers in the basement <laughs> with <laughs> lots of unfinished things. But um, I did find as I progressed because I've got a few books already you know i'm writing on number 30 now so um wow I'm, yeah i'm i'm actually when i started out all i could do was type in a uh, text into word you know and i just kind of whatever i had in my head it, i just you know put it just poured out of me and then i typed it up afterwards and i used to write by hand and um i didn't really make a plan or anything but then after a while i found that is very limiting for me as well because i if you don't have the overall picture you just run with whatever is in your head at the moment and you don't have so much filling in it you know so then sure. there was still a lot of flesh missing in that so um i i would say if you read like my first novel and the last one that was published now um you you can tell from those two alone what kind of a um, development i've made as as a person and as a writer you know you can tell both of that in, in there already and um so having said that making my plans and whatever my characters always hijack the story and something else is going as happening <laughs> which i totally haven't planned people well, that's a good have thing. That and plan you know <laughs> it's just here i am what do you want to do huh <laughs> yeah fantastic so, thanks uh, um yeah, so um, then um, the next question, of course, and that's the big one, is you've had quite a lot of success with that book, haven't uh, you? How, how well was that received? Like, you know, tell me. Yeah, so um, I was kind of, I've actually been pretty shocked with um, how well it's done. Um, it, uh, um, you know, it, early on it won, um, uh, a number of literary awards. So as the finalist in, you know, they're all, they're all kind of indie um, literary awards, but um, you know, that's okay with me. It's my first novel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so four of them, it was a finalist in, and it's kind of fun because um, it won in a lot of different categories. So in some of them, it won for um, visionary novels uh, and another it won for inspirational novels. Another one, it won straight up sci-fi because it's kind of considered time travel. Um, so just about each one, it kind of won um, in in or it final became a finalist um, in a in a different category. So um, that was pretty cool, and uh, um, I think helped it get some recognition um, and helped it move some. And uh, um, you know, I, again, I really didn't know what I was doing from a marketing perspective. Um, but when I finally um, got some, you know, promotional help and put it on sale, it kind of hit a period where it just went crazy. Um, and uh, uh, like one day it sold like 3000 copies in a day. And it went to uh, went to number one on Amazon for time travel. So what was really cool is I'm a big Stephen King fan. Yeah, and at the, at the time, um, his book 11, uh, 20, uh, 11, 22, 63, the he he wrote a time travel book about J F Kennedy, John F Kennedy, mm -hmm. um, which is a fantastic book. Uh, highly recommend it. Um, better book than mine, but anyways, for a brief <laughs> time, 
for a brief, it was it was number one, and my book actually knocked Stephen King's book out of number one, and mine stayed number one for four days. And well, then maybe yours was his, better after all. <laughs> <laughs> and his book went back to number one after that, but okay. that was pretty <laughs> fantastic. Um, uh, so it's been cool. So it's it's uh, won some literary awards. It went yeah. to number one. It's actually. Yeah. Uh, sold pretty well, um, uh, so I, I just yeah I'm I'm uh, really grateful um, to kind of have that that first one do that well and it's yeah. it's still selling all right today and it's it's been out for a couple of years now so uh, it's kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, that just testifies to how great it is. So so you can sell even more. I'm just going to put I put all your awards in the comments as well. And I'm going to put all now um, all the links so people can just click and uh, get the book on whichever platform they so choose. And I will also add this information later on in the uh, info box on YouTube. So everybody can, uh, you know, have a look yeah. there. <laughs> you can't really be humble when you're a writer, can you? <laughs> <laughs> well i've learned as well because i'm also a spiritual coach and that um oh. you know being on my own spiritual journey is uh we have been trained so much to be humble but in the sense of really putting ourselves down and not allowing ourselves to believe in our own talents and greatness so i like to encourage people not to go around being all arrogant and big-headed but saying you know this is my talent and i've achieved that and let's celebrate that you know because yeah. every little achievement needs celebration and um, it's worthy of celebration as well i love that yeah and it, it's good you know the world is big enough for everybody to shine as well yeah. say. so you know it, it's great to say i'm good at that i'm crap at the other you know everybody has some strengths and weaknesses and everybody has their own innate superpowers you know um, I, it's that's the one thing i i yeah. i take time with my students even though i teach technology i always take some time and talk to them about um uh kind of the you know, in the U.S., we have such a sports culture where we 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 kind of get this mentality in our heads that for for us to win, somebody else has to lose. You know, yeah, this win that. lose. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, the, what what I really tell them, and and you know, I spent 30 years as an IT executive, is that the reality is it's it's very rare that there's a situation of kind of win lose that. If you if you have the right mindset, um, there is an abundance of opportunity, and most you know, 99 out of 100 situations can be win-win so, uh, situations. So I don't get a lot into business philosophy in my classes, but that one I do. Yeah, when you have a strong team around you as well, people support you, you know, and you've got each other's back and you lift each other up, you know. And we all have times as well where we kind of lose phase and something happens we feel down you know and then we've got our people to lift us up again and say come on i believe in you you can do this you know it gives you new phase and new motivation to go on as well so it's a lot easier to succeed in a group together rather than just all out on your own and yeah. um, years ago when i thought success was like you know this, this tip of the iceberg kind of thing you know like like you're all alone right on the top there and right. I, thought, I, I don't even want to be i don't want to be all alone i love people you know i love having people around me i'm a teamwork player and that and um so obviously i learned <laughs> <laughs> the top is a plateau and it's not a tip <laughs> you know right. unless you make it of course you know right up to you that's what you said with the mindset you know so i totally agree with you it's, it's all up in the mind definitely so um, i'm just going to interrupt her here for just a second because i want to say hello to um to um Lindsay, she's joined us. She says hello. And FK has joined and he says, this is also interesting. Thank you so much for joining us and letting us know that you're here because I can't actually see on um, on Facebook here that and like who's watching and who's not um, because even when you put in the comments you were obviously watching and it didn't say that anybody was watching so i have no idea it would be so nice if you just you know dropped a comment but if, if you're too shy you know that's okay too we won't hold that against you <laughs> <laughs> 
So moving on from there, so okay. is by now you've got a second book, of course. So yeah. now we want to know what your second book is all about, and what, you know, is it is it time tra travel as well as a different genre? What what is it? Tell us. Sure. Um, so uh, after I finished my first book. Um, I started a second novel and then I also that's when I transitioned careers into my into teaching mm -hmm. and uh, when I transitioned into teaching it was pretty intense uh, it was a little more intense than I thought it would be in terms of just learning everything I needed to do so I decided I really didn't have the, the attention to do another whole novel yeah so instead I decided to write a series of short stories mm -hmm. um, and um, I think it was really good for me because I really wanted to push myself and try some different things. Um, so I was able to do that um, through that process. So I wrote a, um, the, the book is called 10 Tales of a Dark Tomorrow. And what I really tried to write the stories around was um, being inspired by the Twilight Zone. So if, for those of you that have seen the, the original Rod Sterling, uh, uh, you know, black and white, Twilight Zone. Um, that's really kind of the feel and the, um, you know, the jive I was going through. Yeah. Um, so genre wise, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's obviously a collection of short stories, um, but it, it's also, I would say, seven of the 10 stories are more sci-fi related. Um, so it's, it's typically more categorized as science fiction. Yeah. Um, there are a few of them, like in the Twilight Zone, that are more like magical realism. Um, uh, but it's, you know, um, it's really kind of all inspired by that kind of Twilight Zone, which is, you know, um, you know, short tales that typically kind of have a, a twist and and some sort of like, you know, heavy theme at the end and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting as well. So can you tell us maybe for a couple of stories to plot what's happening there so as an example? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it goes anywhere from, um, you know, in one of the stories, um, it's about a couple of young boys that uh, um, uh, one of the boys is actually getting abused by his father. Um, and uh, they he kind of uses bike riding as a chance to kind of get away mm -hmm. and uh what they realize the two boys realize is that um while they bike ride basically time stands still so you kind of see this theme of me and time but uh time stands still um and so uh it kind of follows the, them you know particularly it's from the perspective of the other boy who's you know a little bit um you know shocked and, and, you know, fearful of like, what is this? You know, what is this that when they go bike, you know? So anyways, it's called Let's, Let's Ride Bikes. And uh, it kind of follows um, these two boys as they kind of explore this, um, this kind of strange phenomenon that they're, they're able to kind of go off on these long rides and come back and no time has passed at all. Wow. So that's an example. Um, there's also, you know, um, one of my favorites, it's a little weird, it was a, it was a dream I had. I don't know why it was, but um, it's, uh, it's, very, it's pretty sci-fi. It, it takes place on a distant alien planet where there's a mining operation, and uh, it's all men, and it's, uh, the, the setting is a very dark, um, you know, they're all bald, uh, and they're all kind of... Um, I'd say kind of, uh, it's a very heavy Russian kind of theme. Um, and the, uh, it, it's kind of all about this chef um, that uh, has been their chef for a long time. And uh, he needs, he's, he's supposed to transition out. So a new chef arrives and uh, um, basically he's has to kind of reveal a, uh, a dark secret that I won't, I won't spoil. Um, but it, it's uh, it's called Teach a Man to Fish, and uh, um, I think it's one of the stronger stories. Um, there's another one that's also like another magical realism one where um, it's about a, um, a a girl whose grandmother is moving into their home, and uh, she's not happy about that. Her grandmother's pretty old, and 
you know, has a tough time getting around and has oxygen and all of that. So the, oh, the girl kind of feels like it'll cramp her style and she's a little spoiled. Um, and when her mom and grandmother leave, she goes in her grandmother's room and she found, finds this memory box of her grandmother that has all these little um, knickknacks in it um, of her grandmother's that has her grandmother's collected over the years. And it also has these beads that her grandmother got in New Orleans. And what she finds out is when she holds the beads and, a, and one of the objects, she actually kind of falls into her mother's, her grandmother's memories. And she kind of um, gets a chance to live um, and see things from her grandmother's eyes. Um, and obviously she gets a very different perspective of her grandmother and she really um, begins to see the um, importance of kind of learning from her grandmother and experience her grandmother. The, the, in the, in the, um, I write a little bit about each story before I start about it and I had read a while back which I thought was a really cool fact that um, civilization took a great leap forward when humans lived long enough to actually have grandparents influence um, uh, kids. Yeah. So back yeah. when there was big families and people lived together, um, civilization actually, that, that's one of the secrets of why humans became so much more successful than other animals, because we have a long enough life where grandparents are able to, um, it's actually kind of scientifically shown to be true, that when grandparents were able to kind of have that influence on children and um, that, you know, made a big difference in the success of humans. So I wanted to write about that. Um, and it also gave me a chance, I think two or three of the stories, like I said, I wanted to challenge myself a little bit with these. So two of the three are from female perspectives. Mm. And that really was something that I really didn't feel like was there in my first novel. So I really wanted to work on um, writing with a female perspective. So uh, writing short stories kind of gave me that chance. Yeah, how, how did that go for you? Did you find it easy or was it really a big challenge for you? It was a big challenge, you know, I, you kind of have to tap into, you know, uh, you know, like I just try to think, you know, uh, I know my, you know, obviously my wife and I have been together for over 30 years. Um, oh, so, you know, I can kind of put myself through her, um, you know, viewpoints on life a little bit, um, or my mom, or my daughters, or my sisters, you know, but, but you kind of have to do that. You kind of have to, you know, uh, try to picture things from their, their viewpoint, which is, is challenging, but, um, but I also, you know, felt like it, it went pretty well, so, anyway. Yeah, let's see. I mean, um, I believe that you got awards for that one as well, haven't you? So you'd never do things by half, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was a little bit shocked because my, well, I also had a little shocked that it's done well because my publisher told me that um, short story collections, you know, typically don't do as well as novels. Mm. They're a tough sell. Um, and they also, you know, there's no, um, there's usually not like science fiction short story. It's uh, in book awards, they're more just short story book awards. So it's usually competing with, um, you know, more literary, uh, straight up literary short stories. Mm -hmm. um, and with book awards, it's, that's kind of a tough competition, you know, um, yeah. because, uh, um, it, it, you know, you just, you end up against, you know, some really um, strong themes, I think. Um, so anyways, I was a little shocked um, that, yeah, it, uh, um, it was a finalist in one, and uh, it was a, um, it actually won gold award for Forward Indie uh, Book of the Year for short stories, which I was very shocked um, to see that, um, right, but thrilled, that's thrilled, amazing. that's kind of, yeah. So um, I think it gets highlighted in the next, the September issue of Forward Indie. So hopefully. Oh, wow, um, wonderful. Yeah, we, you have to we'll... tag me in that one, please, as well. When All you right. That so I can see that and share it on. Um, I've just shared in the comments your book awards as well for this book. So for the uh, 10 Tales of a Dark Tomorrow, so people can see. Uh, how wonderful. Some of these, some of these, they actually uh, send you. <laughs> the, the the actual metal, you know, it's, <laughs> cool. it's, uh, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, 
I don't wear it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to have, isn't it? It's nice to have. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of fun. <laughs> so I'm adding the links as well, so people can just click on it and get it straight away. Um, it's all there. Ten Tales of a Dark Tomorrow, and um, you know, do get the novel as well. Um, because obviously that's a really brilliant one also, um, which is called Do You Realize? And um, so the next thing, of course, that we want to know is what you're doing now, because how, how can you possibly top that? I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you will. I, I have a feeling you will. <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll see. Um, so I'm... I'm writing another novel, the one that I started uh, and then put to the side, you know, when I started teaching. Um, and uh, I, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm actually finding the writing much more challenging because I kind of know all the things I should be doing. <laughs> um, there's a little bit of, a, I think, a, a, an advantage almost of, you know, um, being somewhat an innocent writer and just writing, you know. Um, but I'm I'm making progress. I'm I'm about uh, fifty thousand words in, um, so you know at least halfway, maybe a little further. Nice, um, yeah. Oh, Lindsay and it's, says sorry. I'm I'm just interrupting you for one second. Yeah. Lindsay says that she read Ten Tales and it's a great collection. So oh. uh, yeah, you've got a reader's review live right there. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. That's that's very nice. Um, I, I, uh, every time I read a great review, it, it just is such a great uplift. <laughs> it is, isn't it? People yeah. just don't realize like how, um, how much energy that gives yeah. authors. It, it, yeah. it really does. Um, it, it's like a hug, like, yes. isn't it? Like a really good hug. <laughs> yes, it's, it's like a wonderful good. hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I always feel about it. It's just like, I just go like, no. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think people have no idea how happy that makes you. So oh yeah, yeah. See the review like that, absolutely. So um, so now that you're like halfway into your third uh project, writing project, um, how you know you've got some obviously now you've got some experience about this. So um how would you say can writers learn to engage a reader in their prose like you know because um so, some books are written but they don't grip you like that so how and you obviously got it right because otherwise people wouldn't be you know reading it in the droves um so give us some advice on that one how yeah do that? it's definitely an art um you know i i think the first thing and and you probably hear a lot of people talk about this but it was really my very first editor that that kind of walked me through it and it was kind of a revelation revelation for me um was uh show don't tell which sounds you know something like some very simple advice but it's actually really complex and and that is um you know, you're, you're kind of, a, a good book is really kind of a, a trick, you know, it kind of tricks your mind into um, actually, you know, you're, you're setting, you're setting your disbelief aside and you're actually, you know, reading it as if it was a reality. You know, you're kind of, when you're a reader, you're allowing your mind to kind of basically believe that story. Um, and the more that you can, you know, so the things, you have to really try to avoid things that um, would take the um, reader out of that experience. Mm -hmm. So um, every time, for instance, like when the narrator tells the reader um, what a character's emotions are, you're kind of reminding the reader that it's, that it's really just a story. You know, so if you describe the emotion, you know, if, if I say, you know, she was uh, sad, you know, that you're, you're just, it, it's just a story, right? But if I, if I describe, you know, her face is red and tears are streaming down her face and everything, you can, you can more, um, your, your mind can more kind of accept that as, as reality of the moment and you feel the emotion much more than you do if the 
the it's, narrator just told you how to feel. Yeah. So, so the narration is great for setting the stage, you know, telling the setting, but, but um, dialogue and their actions, um, you know, it's much better. Cool. <laughs> that, that one, let's see, I, I think I had a couple here. Um, yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, another thing um, that was kind of, uh, 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 I didn't realize how important it is, but I think it is really important is to, um, is to name everything. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, when you just kind of um, say the character, you know, went into a store or something like that, again, it's just a little clue that it's just a story and it's not real. So um, every time they're, they go down a street, they go in a store, they, you know, go do anything, um, to, to, to pick a name for that street, that store, that um, whatever, um, uh, is also another way to kind of um, keep that uh, real life, you know, uh, them experiencing that, that story as another example. Um, you know, the other thing that I really love as a reader is, and this is why I kind of like science fiction, is because I love when um, a plot like creates lots of possibilities, you know, that your mind starts, you know, you're reading and your mind starts racing and you're like, you know, you've, you've uncovered some, um, you know, some, something that just makes you think, well, this could go anywhere. You know, this mm -hmm. is like anything can happen. And I think that's a really effective way to engage the reader is to kind of um, open up lots of those kind of possibilities. Yeah. And then, um, and then the last one I would give is uh, to make the reader work a little. You know, I think this was probably my biggest challenge when I had to um, rewrite after my first edit of my first book. Okay. Is um, uh, is to really think about ways you can I could make the reader work more. You know, I I, I uh, so the example I think I remember my editor giving me is um, if you know, again, if the narrator says, um, you know, he was married, right? It's kind of like boring, right? But if, if, if my female character sitting across from him, you know, notices the glint of his wedding ring, you know, um, that's how the reader finds out that he's married. It's much more interesting, right? Because then not only, you know, as you didn't tell them, you know, but now it's like, oh, she's noticed that he's wearing a wedding. You know what I mean? So it's doing those kind of things where the reader has to um, make a connection and deduce something um, gets them much more engaged. And it's a much more pleasurable reading experience when uh, the author really tries to make the reader work. Um, and, uh, um, and not just like a mystery, but just you know, deduce little things and figure out little things and make connections. Um, mm -hmm. I think readers like really enjoy kind of their their brain getting really active. Like, oh yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. <laughs> I can testify to that for sure. <laughs> that that's a wonderful way of uh, you know. Uh, that's really really brilliant advice as well. So um, that aside, um, do you have, you know, any other tips for emerging writers? Um, you know, when somebody first starts out and they don't really know what they're doing, what would you tell them? Yeah, so I really struggled with dialogue early, and I think there's a couple things there, you know, one is, um, you know, people, I've even heard people say, like, go to a coffee shop and just record a conversation and then go back and like look at it, like, you know, translate it to text and look at exactly how people are talking, you know, like, so little things will come out like, you know, people use contractions, right? Uh, almost always, whenever there's a chance to use contractions, they use them. So if your writing's a little more formal and you're not used to using a lot of contractions, you know, you've got to do those kind of things. Um, but the other thing is to read your dialogue aloud um, that I think is a great trick um, because <laughs> it, you'll notice it, you'll hear it if it doesn't yeah. sound right. Um, yeah. So it's something I'm still working on, but I think, you know, paying a lot of attention to dialogue and, and uh, um, you know, uh, 
uh, reading it aloud and doing your best to make it sound like a real conversation mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is huge and kind of differentiates a lot of, I think, beginning writers from, you know, more experienced writers. Yeah. Um, that's one. Uh, another one is, and I, I, I kind of do this naturally, um, but I, I kind of write in fear of being bored, boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the one thing I don't want to be is boring. You know, I mean, that's, yeah. um, it's kind of, um, I know, I know when I was writing my first novel, I just kept telling myself, how do I, how do I make this, you know, more intriguing? And so, mm -hmm. you know, the easiest way is just conflict, right? Just yeah. conflict, conflict, conflict. How can you introduce conflict, you know? But I think it's also can be like insights, um, you know, not necessarily telling a reader an insight, but writing something where, you know, they'll logically kind of um, come to an insight on their own. Again, it's kind of like making readers, um, uh, making readers work. Um, and then, you know, obviously action, you know, action is, um, I think, always exciting whenever you can describe action, you know, um, as opposed to just dialogue or just you know, narration and things like that, you're, you're engaging and, and emotion, you know, um, oh, yeah. I think, you know, you've got to look for ways, you know, particularly me being more of a science fiction writer and a man, you know, it's, it's harder for me to um, really make sure there's a lot of emotion in my stories. But um, I think those are the things that you, you know, you have to do to, to again, um, Go from that beginning writer to to maybe more of a more advanced um and then i you know another thing i i always look out for is tropes you know it's yeah if you go out you can just find you know uh, i think there's a website called tv tropes where if you if you look through it you're like well how can i write it anything i write is going to end up being, being a trope and it's not so much i think you know like um like for me, example, you know, I, I wrote about time travel, but I tried to make it really unique. You know, I tried to make it not be about the butterfly effect and how time travel, you know, how it's uh, the paradox of changing the future. I instead made it really about how does the time travel affect the, the traveler themselves? How does that change their, so even if it is something, you know, um, as common in literature as time travel, um, mm -hmm. how can you make it yours? How can you make it different? Um, how can you make it different? So, you know, some examples of tropes, just so um, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Like, the really common ones are like the main character's perfect. You know, they have no flaws, they have no faults. You know, that that's um, you know, you 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 want your main character to change and grow. You know, so you, they need to have some faults and flaws and and issues when you start, right? Um, otherwise, you you know the readers really won't won't engage. Or um, uh, you know, a really common one is like when people struggle. How, a newer author, how do I um, describe my main character? They'll have the character look in the mirror and describe themselves and their and their thoughts. You know, and it just it's in a lot of books, you know, um, so you got to watch out for things like that. Or Ex Machina, which is, you know, the magical device that kind of um, uh, resolves the plot at the end of the book. You know, a lot of science fiction has that where something, you know, nearly magical happens. Um, mm -hmm. So that those are just some examples. But, you know, if you're, if you're writing and you want to, um, you know, elevate your writing, you really need to um, kind of understand what some of those um, tropes are and try to, try to be a little more unique. Um, and then the last piece of advice I have is, um, you know, write your first draft for you, write the book you want to write, write the book you'd want to read. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, edit and rewrite for everybody else. You know, like, you, you know, write from your heart, write what you want to write. But then I think as you rewrite and edit, you really have to consider other people's lenses and what would make sense, what wouldn't make sense, and kind of what the reader's going to experience. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the last piece of advice is write for you, rewrite for everybody else. Yeah. I find what you said before as well, that reading out loud, which I love to do anyway, and my children, you know, always took advantage of that as well. <laughs> 
and their friends as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's so much fun, but it's also, it helps so much that in a way you get more distant and then you pick up more on things. You, you don't kind of go with your brain in what you have in, in your mind for, of the story yourself already, but you more get what somebody who totally doesn't know what's happening yet. Um, yeah. they get out of it or, or not as the case might might be isn't it and then you can really oh my god you know I should have said something about you know he or that person has blonde hair and then he's got like brown hair or something like that you know and you yeah. pick up on that and you have to you know little details like that as well so that is very important isn't it so um, that comes out much better not just the way you formulate your sentences but also um the overall context and the descriptions and you know where it works and where it flows smoothly and where it doesn't isn't it so when my first novel came out on audiobook the first time i listened to the audiobook yeah i felt like there was like a thousand things i wanted to change you know even though i read my book to myself out loud yeah. it's also another experience to hear somebody else narrate it you know um you know, a voice actor narrated, and uh, yeah. I kind of wish I had that experience before it was completed. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> it is. It does help, isn't it? And um, it. There's. I think that there's also. Um, do you have that feeling that? Um, a lot of authors I've talked to find um, that once the book is out, all of a sudden they go like, oh no, I don't like this about it. I don't like oh, yeah. this about it. And, you know, as soon as it's out, it's like they're having stage fright, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 Have that as well. <laughs> I have that as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. But you can't, you know, you could. You could literally, you know, I mean, there's overwriting, right? Where if you just keep it too long and you keep torturing the text or the, you know, you can, you can, you can actually um, kind of ruin it with over, overwriting as well, you know, yeah. purple prose and all of that. So yeah. you got to find the right point to just decide, okay, this is, this is good. You know, it's never going to be perfect. There is no perfect book, right? No, absolutely. Um, I what? had to look something up yesterday for a friend of mine in my fourth novel, which is like years back, you know, and I was just reading a paragraph and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there are like well, things in there that I thought I'd, I'd do differently <laughs> now, you know. <laughs> but we have to really be able to say, you know, that that was a stage in life and it was good for what it was at the time. Right. With what we had you know what, what, what we could work for at the time and it was you know and, and now it's a you know not just books but we as writers even as human beings we're a work in progress aren't we it never stops yeah. yeah one one thing that was great that my publisher had me do um right before my first book was published mm -hmm. was she had me um she said pick your three favorite books yeah. and three books that you think are like the best books of all time and then go on amazon and read all their one star reviews and it was just for me it was like really uh, amazing because you have these books that you just you know you you think are nearly perfect and yeah. you go out and there are people who just hate them with a passion you know <laughs> and that just think they are the worst books you know i mean whether it's you know um uh, the Tale of Two Cities or Pride and Prejudice or, you know, you name it. Um, there are people that think they are just, you know, awful, awful books. And it really helps, it, it really helped me realize that, you know, every book um, comes out differently through the lens of that person's life experience. Mm. So, you know, some yeah. people are going to read, you know, a book and just absolutely love it. And other people are going to read that exact same book and absolutely hate it, you know. So that's just life. And that's how, because we're all different. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was helpful for me to kind of have that perspective, um, you know, before it kind of got out there in the world. That so. was really a good piece of advice. Um, I yeah. remember um, my son's German teacher in his final class, um, he actually, well, my son actually defended Jane Austen 
Pride and Prejudice against his slagging it off because it's my favorite book of all times. He was <laughs> like, my mom wouldn't let you say that. And, you know, you really went like a champion in there. I was like, I'm so proud of you, darling. <laughs> 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 that was really <laughs> personal you know it felt very personal and it's um it is not nice to to get a bad review definitely but um it's also it's a learning curve as well you know well, it, it shows you where um you know that that people have so many different perspectives you, you can't please them all you can't win yeah. them all and that's totally okay as well isn't it we're all diverse and we have different um different tastes as well i remember yeah. Um, there was one, uh, I've, I've written a short story for an anthology, so, uh, so somebody wrote in a review, um, she didn't like that in one of the stories was, um, I think in one or, I, did, I don't know, in, in the other one was as well, but um, in one of them, which was mine, <laughs> there was some uh, graphic <laughs> curse words, wow. you know, so, but then there were also two Navy SEALs involved, and they're not go going to say, oh, would you like a cup of tea, darling? And yeah, you know, going, darling. They're not talking like that, are they? So yeah. they, they're going to say the F word and things, you know, so yeah, yeah. put them in there. <laughs> it's more yeah, like, you're, you're writing honest, right? Yeah. I, I like to be honest and authentic and, you know, as much as I can as well, you know. Um, obviously, you know, everything is a bit nicer in romance novels than in real life. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it has to kind of stay realistic and feel like you can really identify with it. Like, you know, you want the reader to, to grasp so much that they think like it's happening to them while they're reading it, isn't it? Right. So they can really identify with the story. And um, I think... Um, that that's um, that you know that's my way of doing it really you know to to that but um, yeah some people don't like that <laughs> for sure yeah so um your absolute oh hi Rebecca Rebecca Stevenson joined me uh, us sorry um she is she's what I wanted to say is she's a wonderful friend of mine and um, she's also a coach and um, she gives advice on anxiety so um, beautiful beautiful mind and um, we've um, actually put in the comments here all of the wonderful tips that you've given thank you so much for that and of course what we also have to add is all your social media links because we can find you on social follow media me places. yes exactly <laughs> Stalk Kevin, stalk him <laughs> to death, yay! <laughs> so he's got a website, he's got a Facebook page, he's got Twitter and Instagram and Goodreads. And you know, and it's very nice if you put uh, reviews on Goodreads, by the way, a lot of people don't know that who are not themselves in the writing industry, they're, they're more, um, you know, uh, readers, they don't know how very often they don't know how important reviews are. And um, if you leave one on Amazon, for example, if, if you're not with the US Amazon, like I'm in Germany, so I'm with amazon.de for Deutschland. <laughs> um, it's, um, you know, that often isn't shown on, you know, or just at the bottom, you can click international reviews or something, you know, so it kind of gets lost. But if you also put your re review on Goodreads, they're all together there, no matter where they come from. And that is a really wonderful platform to have everything in one place. Um, there's another one, BookBub, as well, and things, you know, and all authors, I think. But Goodreads is, is a really big one, isn't it? It's owned yeah. by Amazon as well, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different concept in that way. So. Um, uh, that that's a great platform for readers as well to find new authors and wonderful books that I love and so on. Um, they do have some groups as well, readers and writers groups and things. So, um, you know, hop on there, um, you know, can make friends with everyone. You can uh, recommend books yourself to your fr uh, friends and vice versa, get some book recommendations browse through it and leave those reviews please because you know that that's an author hug a review is an author hug <laughs> so, absolutely mm -hmm. so kevin it was absolutely wonderful to uh, to be speaking with you um this evening and uh, for my evening your afternoon isn't it still light yes. outside for you yes <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you so much 
Yeah, thank you for doing that with me. Um, it was absolutely lovely having you and so interesting. And I'm so happy that you've shared all that, you know, with us. Um, so a lot of readers as well, especially and other writers as well, you know, can, you know, get some ideas and tips and, you know, keep can keep that in mind for their next work and progress. And uh, maybe it's your fault that uh, somebody else's book is going to get even better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Room for everyone, right? We just talked exactly, about that. Exactly, absolutely. So um, get his books because he really writes wonderfully. Um, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, the concept alone of those stories, it's, it's just, I love it. Um, and um, to, you know, with that, I would say good night to everybody. Thank you for joining us live. And thank you for those who are watching the replay later. Uh, say hello. <laughs> so we know you've been watching and um, subscribe also to my YouTube channel. I'm going to put that in the comments afterwards. And um, so you, you can actually share that also with your writer friends who might not have an account on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> So spread it large and wide, <laughs> far, far and wide, sorry. And um, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank and you again. I'll see you soon. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye.